Hi there, it's Wukash for the Tech Travel Geeks, and we now have an amazing device for review from the Mi Community UK, the brand new Xiaomi Mi 11 Ultra, which is the top of their Mi line. It's been my dream device since the rumors about it started, so I'm really excited to experience for the next couple of weeks. This is a pre-release device and we received it without the packaging, charger etc, so we're unable to do our usual unboxing. So, in this video, we'll go through my first impressions of the device after using it for a few days, together with some initial camera samples after a few photo walks. We'll follow it up in the near future with a software setup video, a full camera review and potentially some other videos, so if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the Tech Travel Geeks to see more videos from us. Let's start with the build and design. The first thing you notice is the massive camera unit on the back. It stands out around 4mm above the rest of the device, but this is a feature rather than a bug, as we say in the tech world. I'll discuss the cameras in much more detail later on, but I can say that the camera bump is definitely justified here, and it hasn't bothered me in the slightest. Actually, since it's so big and wide, it makes it quite stable when you put it flat on the back, so it doesn't wobble like some other devices. Not only that, the device is so well balanced that you can actually stand it vertically on a flat surface. I wouldn't keep it like that for too long, but it's definitely a cool party trick. In addition to three excellent cameras, the camera unit also sports a secondary screen on the back. It's actually the same screen we've seen on the Mi Band 5, which we unboxed here on the Tech Travel Geeks, and it can be used to display the time and date, some notifications or messages, but more importantly, it serves as a selfie camera screen. We'll discuss this later on, but to me, this is a game changer. Back to the design though, some might argue that you don't really need that secondary screen for selfies, as the back of the device is just like a big mirror. It's very reflective and a big fingerprint magnet, so it might be worth using the included transparent case or getting a different one once they're available online. The mirror back is actually almost the same as the one we've seen on the Mi 10T Pro 5G, which Matteo unboxed on the channel back in November 2020. My model came in the ceramic black color and there's also the ceramic white available. The overall build of the device is very premium. The back is ceramic and the frame is aluminium, so it feels very sturdy. It does add to the weight though, as the device clocks in at 234 grams. However, it's not so bad in my opinion, and I think that the weight is justified by the build and cameras. In addition to that, it's one of the first Xiaomi phones that is dust and water resistant with the coveted IP68 certificate, which is fantastic to see. The front of the device is another highlight, the screen. It's a 6.81 inch AMOLED panel which lives up to the Ultra in the name. It's curved on the sides though, and the bezels are really small, so it doesn't make the phone feel too big. The screen itself is top of the line, with 1440x3200 pixels at 20x9 aspect ratio, it boasts around 515 pixels per inch, which is great. What's more, you can switch between 1440 and 1018 software, plus the device uses adaptive resolution, so it won't drain your battery too fast. It also supports 120Hz refresh rate, HDR in both HDR Plus and Dolby Vision standards, as well as peak brightness of 1700 nits, which is one of the brightest available. It also supports 10-bit color depth, so it can display over 1 billion colors, yes with a B, and boasts an incredible 480Hz sample rate, which is double compared to most of the competition. To top it all off, it's protected by Gorilla Glass Victus, which is the latest standard in screen protection. If we look around the device, there's unfortunately no carriage port aka 3.5mm audio jack, so we'll have to rely on the converters, which I believe are included in the box. But this is the standard for premium smartphones just now. However, the Mi 11 Ultra compensates for that with the dual speakers tuned by Harman Kardon. And my initial impressions after using the phone for a few days is that they're really loud, and the sound comes out really clearly, with quite a bit of bass in there as well. I'm really impressed so far. The phone obviously charges with USB-C, but the charger included, which I unfortunately didn't have for review, is a 67 watt one, which, according to the advertising, can top up the phone from 0 to 100% in under 40 minutes. That's just brilliant, but it's not where it ends. The phone also supports wireless charging, and it can also go up to 67 watt, which is unheard of, making wired and wireless charging almost indistinguishable. You'll have to get a specific charger for that, but it's amazing to see. To add to this, the device also supports reverse wireless charging in case you need to top up a different device wirelessly. 
coupled with a large 5000 mAh battery, it makes the Mi 11 Ultra a literal power horse. Speaking of which, let's talk about the performance. The Mi 11 Ultra is powered by the latest and most powerful Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 chipset with an octa-core processor, which will give you the highest available performance. It comes with Xiaomi's new phase-changing cooling system, which should keep the phone performing well during long gaming sessions. After a few days of use, I can only say great things about the device, but we'll talk more about that in our upcoming videos about the device. The chipset also includes a 5G radio, so you'll be able to use the latest connection technology. 5G coverage has been increasing in my area actually, and I managed to get 5G speeds just a few hundred meters from my house. The speed went up to almost 400 megabits per second, which is great to see. The review device I have came with a massive 12 gigabytes of RAM, which is getting up to some crazy territories. For context, my first PC back in 1996 had 16 megabytes of memory, and my first computer, the Atari 65XE, had 64 kilobytes. So there's been quite a bit of progress there. This model has 256 gigabytes of UFS 3.1 storage, but there are also other models which you can see on the screen. There's no external memory card support, but with this much storage, I don't think it's really needed. When it comes to software, we will have a separate video coming up in the next few days, talking about the setup and user experience. Over the last few days, the performance of the device has been fantastic so far both for everyday tasks and for some gaming I've done. Unsurprisingly, you can set the graphics in Fortnite to epic and it works just great. More on that coming in future videos. For security, you can use in-screen fingerprint reader, which has worked quite well for me so far, unlike some budget devices I tried recently, plus the usual face detection. There's also NFC, but it can be market dependent, plus an IR blaster at the top. Finally, let's talk about the cameras. This is by far my favorite feature of this device. As mentioned, it has three different cameras and all are top of the line. The headline camera is the 50 megapixel one, which has a massive 1 over 1.12 inch sensor. This is getting dangerously close to once in 1 inch digital cameras, for example Mateo's Sony ZV-1. Due to how much light the sensor can get, it creates a natural bokeh or background blur, which gets added without any artificial software tricks like the portrait mode. Just look at some of those photos I took over the last few days. Just remember that low aperture means that the focus area is also much smaller, so you might have problems with focus on some nearby objects. In those cases though, you can always switch to ultra wide or move the phone a bit further away. We'll do a more detailed camera review soon, but just look at those fantastic shots. I'm personally loving them. The dynamic range is also excellent. Just let me share this sunset photo over a lake. You can see both the lake in all its details, the swans, the road and grass on the side, and even the ruins of the St. Anthony's Chapel in the corner. To me, this is just stunning. The next camera is the 48 megapixel ultra wide one. It's actually wider than many competitors at 0.5 zoom, so you will be able to put a lot of the frame in it. It's fantastic for landscapes, just check some of them I took around Edinburgh. However, due to how wide it is, be warned that it can distort objects in the corners, so avoid photographing people if they're on the side of the frame. Nevertheless, whenever I wanted to capture nature, I tended to default to the ultra-wide camera, as it's just great. It can also serve as a macro camera, but in some of my initial tests, the focusing range is not much better than the main camera, so I still prefer that for objects in close-ups. The third lens is a periscope telephoto one, and it's also a 48 megapixel sensor. This one is a 5x optical zoom, so it allows you to nicely zoom in and increase the focal range of what you can capture. I like that I was allowed to capture some animals in the distance, like birds or those cows which were quite far away from me. I actually managed to film a quick video with that lens, and we wouldn't be able to experience what's happening there if it wasn't for the 5x zoom. However, I can't say I'm the biggest fan of the 120x zoom label on the back of the device. What happens is that the phone crops in and expands the pixels, and the photos aren't really that usable over 10 or maybe 20 times zoom. But you never have to use it, so it's not a problem at all. One thing on the back which I did find amazing is the aforementioned secondary screen. It has allowed me to take some of my favorite selfies I've ever taken. It works great in both the wide and ultra-wide lens, and I think those photos look just great. 
I'm sure I'd be using this more in the future, especially when we're able to travel again. Two things to note is that the extra screen doesn't work for video, so don't expect to use it for vlogging or for portrait photos. But since the depth of field is so good on the main lens, I wasn't missing that at all. Speaking of video, you can actually film 8K footage in 24 frames per second on all three lenses, which is very unusual, and the same for 4K60. I'll do some proper video shots later on. There's also the usual selfie camera, which is a 20 megapixel one, and it works quite well. And this one does include the portrait mode. Unfortunately, it doesn't do 4K video, which is a bit of a bummer. Overall, as you might have gathered by now, I'm very impressed by this device. So much so that, while on my photo walk the other day, I said to my girlfriend that while I don't get to keep this device permanently, I'm very likely to buy it myself afterwards. The phone isn't available for sale just yet, and we don't know the UK price, but the price in Europe has been suggested at around 1200 euros. We'll keep you updated once we hear more. So that's it! Those are my initial thoughts about the Xiaomi Mi 11 Ultra. We'll follow this up with the software setup and experience video, so make sure to subscribe to the Tech Travel Geeks to get notified when it goes live. But for now, thanks for watching!